The Lord bless you, saints of the Most High God. Let me welcome all of us another time in to our Bible study. And God be praised. He has given us strength and has helped us over these couple of weeks as we have been going through the series Walking in the Word. By now, we all would have a good feel as to the importance, as to the value of the Word of God in our lives, in the life of every single child of God. By now, we will realize that an absence of the Word does place us in a position of great disadvantage because we are unable to pull from that rich life-giving source so that we can be guided that according to the word it is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The absence of the word certainly places us in a position of disadvantage and there are many saints of God there are many who are not clear as to why they are not living the overcoming life they know that something is wrong there are folks who are saved and have been saved for a long time but for whatever reason it just is not coming together for you as a child of God. Uh, sometime up, sometime down. It happens so frequently and deep down on the inside, we just know and we just feel that we are not the kind of person that we, when we look at the scripture, it describe that we should be the kind of overcoming, the kind of victory the kind of on the move Christian that we know we are supposed to be somehow somewhere we are not living that overcoming life as a son of God we know that the son of God is supposed to be moving from lowlands and valley over mountain tops we are supposed to be rallying and somewhere along the line we are just not seemingly getting or having the advantage as we know that as children of the Most High God, we are supposed to have. Well, as we go through and as we have been going through, we have been seeing that many times the things that cause us to be lackluster in our walk, in our approach to positive overcoming Christian living is the fact that the things that are contained in the word, the things that are there to give us energy, give us vitamins, give us the things that are solid food that will cause us to be strengthened and to grow. We are lacking in those critical elements because we do not have, we do not read, we do not absorb, we do not meditate on, we do not action the words of Almighty God. And I stand here tonight and declare, I teach it, I will declare it to any saint of God, if there is an absence of the word, there is going to be an absence of overcoming, victorious, advancing living as it relates to our Christianity. And so now is a good time before we look at this next segment. Now is a good time for us as children of God to do some introspecting to examine ourselves, to see what time we have dedicated 
to reading the word, to studying the word, to, to, to just getting in the word. Uh, at the start of this series, we made the point, and it is a point that we cannot overemphasize because it goes to the heart of the value of the words of Almighty God. God honors his word above his very name. And we make no bones about the name of Jesus. Those of us that are apostolic in our belief, we believe in the power of the name of Jesus. We do everything in the name, everything with the name, because the name means so much. And God used name to describe things about him, things about his very nature, things about his ability, his ability to provide, his ability to protect, his ability to do miraculous things, just to show that he's more than enough for all of these things. God Almighty has used a name to describe these things about himself so that we can emphatically declare that the name is powerful, the name is important, the name means so much. And yet, this great God of heaven declares that he honors, that he exalts his word above his very name. And this is simply because his word means everything. His words depict who he is. If you are going to talk about God being sovereign, it has everything to do with his word because he has to be able to back up anything that he says. And if he's unable to do that, he cannot be God. So that his word speaks to the very essence of his sovereignty, the very essence of his godness. If his word cannot be embraced, if his words are not bankable, if his words are meaningless, if he cannot fulfill every promise that he ever made, then he is unable to hold the title of God Almighty. And so he honors his word above his very name. And so, brothers and sisters, if we therefore treat his words lightly, if we therefore treat his words with disdain, which so many that name the name of Jesus Christ do, if we do that and if we continue in that, then I submit to all of us, our lives are going to be failure. Our Christianity is going to be a failure. We cannot pretend to be advancing in the Lord. We cannot pretend to be a powerful, earth-shaking Christian. And our lives are not steeped in the words of Almighty God. It does not go together. It cannot reconcile. And I state that categorically and emphatically. You cannot be a person that is living an overcoming Christian life if there is not the presence, the continual abiding of that saint in the word of Almighty God. We cannot live outside of his word. His word speaks to bread and bread speaks so that thing that gives us energy and strength so that we can live and therefore the absence of bread, the absence of the word means that our lives are going to be anemic, it is going to be empty, we are going to be weary, we are going to be faint and we cannot be overcomers. And so I beg that statement of fact in a very emphatic way and i'm not trying to dialogue and discourse this particular issue 
uh, having gone through what we have gone through already, I can only make this statement of fact that none of us can advance in our walk with God. None of us can advance in our relationship with the Almighty as a son of God, as a Christian, as a person seeking to follow Christ. None of us can positively make a declaration that we are progressing and we are victorious and we are overcoming if we do not live in the word, if we are not guided by the things that are contained in the word. This book is everything. And I make that and state that without apologies. If you're a young person and you are uh, not in the word, if you're one of our beloved young people and you find it difficult to read this book regularly, you find it difficult to extract and study things from this book regularly. You find it difficult to just flip through and at opportunities that will come. You just glance, glance and go through the word just to re reflect in our minds what happened in Genesis and what happened in Revelation and what happened in between. If we are averse to digging into the word, then I can sit here and safely say that you are a young person that will not make it. I want you to make it. I know that you want to make it. But without the word, without the word washing and filling and captivating our minds, it is not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many questions we answer for you. It doesn't matter how many field trips we go on and we sit and we talk about this and that and we take the questions and we answer your questions. Answering questions and answering them the right way is not going to be of great help if you as an individual, if you as a young person don't have that desire to get into the word and not just have the desire but actually get into the word of God. It is very, very important that we understand that and that we action getting into the word. It is important. The word is tonic. As I said before, the word is food. And if we don't have this tonic, if we are not eating of the bread of life, then we cannot have the spiritual life that will uh, advance us to that place where we ought to be. And so I cannot overemphasize the importance, brothers and sisters. I, I picked out our young people just a while ago, but I'm speaking to our elderly saints also. I'm speaking to our children also. I'm speaking to our middle-aged saints also. I'm speaking to the body of Christ. We must have the word. And if we don't have a love, Right now for the word, it is saying something that is very serious and we better develop a love for the word. It can happen. We just need to push against this flesh, push against how we feel, push against the walls that are blocking us, push against the things that the adversary Satan is putting in our way and trying to inject into our minds that we have so much else to do that there can be no time to give to reading, understanding, and living the word. No word, no victory. No word, no advancement in the kingdom. No word ultimately leads to no heaven. And I say that without a Apology. It is fact. Now, all of us know that we are engaged in a warfare, but it's just a word on the lips of many of God's people. Yes, I am involved in spiritual battle. Yes, the Bible declares in Ephesians chapter 6 
that we wrestle not against flesh and blood and we know the scripture and therefore we can say safely say that we are all engaged yes in in spiritual warfare ephesians 6 verse 12 for we wrestle not and i'm quoting it again again we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places we know that and it has become uh, a, a kind of a buzzword in terms of this particular scripture on the lips of many of God's people. Oh, I know I'm engaged in warfare. The devil wants to get me, but I will not allow him to have the upper hand in my life. And these are the things that we say. These are the things that we utter from our lips. But many of us, and we know it so very well, our lives does not reflect the fact that we are in warfare our lives does not show that we are in warfare and even if we accept the fact that we are in warfare many of us by virtue of how we are living we are the ones that are suffering in this warfare we are suffering because we treat this warfare lightly we are suffering because we don't understand exactly what this warfare is all about uh, at, at the, over the last couple of weeks we looked at some things and we started to get a sense that it is not that satan is going to back you up along lindale avenue and throw some hits in your face it is not that he's going to back you up as you walk through the gates to come under the tent and take your bible from you no it is not carnal it is not physical it is not flesh and blood but it is something of a spiritual nature and we made the point some weeks ago that he is on a particular road and this road is leading to our minds he wants to get into the minds of God people in addition to other things that is going to take place in the spiritual realm. We are, we're making the point and we are still declaring that there is a particular strategy of Satan where he wants to manipulate the minds of the people of God. And we are going to see that operation uh, being manifested more and more. We are going to understand some more how vicious, how, how dangerous this warfare, this battle that you and I as Christians are engaged in. You see, what has happened is that many of us, and it is the, it is the nature of man, and we must be careful that we don't get sucked in to this kind of thing where we become accustomed to where we become acclimatized to and therefore take things for granted because that is, is what has happened to many christians to the extent that christianity has now become a mundane um thing uh, we just go through the course. It is just a, a, a thing that we are in and we take it as it comes and a day at a time and anything goes and oh, so be it. We have become acclimatized. We have now taken for granted this great salvation that God has given to us. We have made light of the sacrifice that Jesus made uh, when he shed his blood. We have just trivialized this most important element of living, walking with Almighty God. It is the same way how men and women have trivialized, have taken lightly, have become accustomed and acclimatized to each other in marital relationships to the extent that things that we should do to maintain 
a certain level of respect for each other. We have become so acclimatized to each other that we now take each other for granted. That we not even show respect and love and, and, and give reverence to each other, you know, in terms of the term reverence. We no longer say the things that we once said that would cause us to remember that we are husband and wife and we are in a relationship to the extent that the relationship break down to the ground. It is the nature of men for things like these to happen. And so because it is in our nature, we have to take every step. Yes, we have to make positive moves. We have to do things to ensure that it happens so that it is not going to be the norm each day to just pick up the Bible and read it. We are going to have to fight to make it happen. We are going to have to put things in place to make it happen. And I want to make this point that it only becomes a part of our system when we have fought and we have pushed and we have pressed and we have done everything and we fight against how we feel that we don't feel to read this morning or we don't feel to read today or we don't feel to get into the word at this moment. We have got to fight against that inertia and overcome that inertia and do it today and do it tomorrow and do it next week and keep on doing it until it becomes a part of our spiritual biology. And it then comes natural. And even if it comes natural, if we leave it up, we are going to go right back to square one. Where, because naturally, because the flesh is opposed to the things of God, we go right back down. And so, brothers and sisters, as we look into the word, be vigilant. Know and understand that we must be constantly pushing, constantly warring, constantly fighting against the temptation to just put it aside and to sleep and to do everything else. We have got to know that we must show due respect to the word of God and show due respect to the God of the word. It is very important and that only comes when we push, when we determine, when we declare and decide that we are going to be students of the word. And if we are not, we are setting ourselves up, brothers and sisters, to fail. And so, yes, we are in warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But many of us don't even know the extent of the warfare that we are in. Do you know that this is a vicious warfare where there are no referees? That anything goes. The adversary will do anything and use anything at his disposal to get to you, to trip us up to get to me, to get to any saint, to trip us up and to cause us to lose our way. Many saints right now, and I'm not asking, you know yourselves, failing in this walk, wondering why. Why don't I have the overcoming life? Why am I constantly at this place? Why, why? Why? Well, I'm here to share, to declare, to let all of us understand that the adversary that we have to contend with knows a thing or two about warfare because he has been around for much longer than you and I. We are around for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 80 years. 
90, 100 years the most. He has been around for centuries. Millennia. He knows a thing or two. He knows how to get at our minds. He knows how to pull certain weapons and wheel it against us. To defeat us, to pull us down, to stop us on our way. He knows. But then, you and I should know that in this warfare, God has given us weapons. And I want us to understand that when we speak about the word, we are not just saying, and I'm not just submitting to you, that we just read the word to know it in our head and just walk thereby. And, you know, that is crucial. That is what we must do. But it goes deeper than that. And we are going to look at the deeper aspect of the word. That it is the weapon that you and I must have if we are going to be victorious in this warfare. Yes. Tell me, criminals are doing everything to take over Jamaica land we love. We are in a dangerous time. But then it is not only here in Jamaica. If we go over into the U.S., look at what is happening in the U.S. now. And we see, in many instances, criminals, rioters, anarchists trying to take over certain grounds and so forth in jamaica it is the police that goes head on with these criminals now it doesn't matter how much and you tell me a police goes into a particular local and they confront criminals with high-powered weapons and they are shooting and they are doing all in their power to have the higher ground and to keep the security forces at bay and they have the m16s and the ak-47s and they are blasting them you tell me how the security forces will prevail even if they have bulletproof vests even if they have hard helmets even if they have the, those powerful shoes with iron tips and so if they have these things the the, the, the iron clad shoes and the, the the bulletproof vests and they have on hard helmets and the adversary the criminals have ak-47s and m-16s and bazookas and all the different submachine guns and they are barking at the security forces what can the security force do if all they have is defensive armor? Bulletproof vests, a helmet on their head, metallic helmet, shoes with iron tips and all of those things. What will they be able to do against the criminals? Nothing much. All that they have is defensive weapons. They need even to show similar force, offensive weapons also. They need to have not just a baton, but they need to have their own guns, their own AK-47, their own M16 to match the wit of the criminals. The absence of offensive weapons will render the security forces ineffective in the warfare against criminals. Did you know that many of us in Christendom that verbalize and speak that we have or we are in warfare, we are just talking because we do not have any offensive weapon to take on the adversary and to jab at him, and to, to, to strike at him, and to turn inside of the, the, the adversary, and to pull 
throughout his entries, we have no weaponry because we don't have the word. And the word is that offensive weapon that we must have to use to strike the enemy and to have higher ground and to have the upper hand. The absence of the word means we have no offensive weapon. And in the absence of a sword in our case, in modern terms, it would be a gun. In the absence of that, we have nothing to fight the adversary with. There are a lot of sins in spiritual warfare right now and cannot overcome because they do not have the weapon that is required for them to be overcomers. And this is the reason why so many of God's people who are in warfare, who are walking as Christians, who are talking as Christians, constantly go through being defeated on the losing side, wondering how is it that I am not having the upper hand, wondering how is it that I feel that I am always on the ground. Why? Yes, you are in warfare, but you are losing because there is no offensive weapon in the arsenal that will cause us to fight back and to strike and to cut and to stab and to chop the enemy. And the offensive weaponry in our arsenal is the sword of the spirit, brothers and sisters. And we will see it now which is the word of God. And if there is no word, then there is no sword. And if there is no sword, then you can strike the enemy and push him against the wall and push him back into it. No. And you and I can be in warfare, but we are making no advance. And the adversary can easily have you in his corner and listen i'm going to show us now that this warfare is not something to play with this warfare that you and i are in as people of god is not something to treat lightly is a life and death matter it is a vicious conflict it is a wicked conflict. There are no referees, so to speak. And the adversary will use anything and everything at his disposal. To, if he can physically kill you, he will kill you. After he messes up your mind and cause you and I to, to, to swear against God. Because he's pushing us in that regard. To this own God. That is what he wants to do with our minds. To corrupt it. So that we now start to believe that God is not for me. God is really not real. There is no God if you are if, if, if you're there. And these thoughts start to creep into the mind. Where is God? There really is no God. I have not seen this. This is no longer happening. Look at what is happening to me. Where is God? If God was real, this couldn't be happening to me. And all kind of things start to captivate the mind and is going through our system. When the adversary is finished with us, we many times will curse God. And then he moves to physically kill us. So that we die and go to a devil's hell. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, that in this warfare, anything goes. Don't treat lightly what you and I are engaged in when it comes to the adversary, the devil. So I'm going to share two little, some, a few points with us as we drill in and as we get a little bit deeper into this warfare. The Bible tells us in Ephesians, and we started a while ago, 6 and verse 12, for we wrestle not. But you see that word wrestle? Many of us don't even 
understand the, 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 the root and therefore the meaning of what Paul was trying to convey when he used the word wrestle. And I'm going to take us through and I want us to focus on the screen, on the, on the first slide, so that we can understand so that we can understand exactly when we speak about wrestling, what exactly it is we are talking about. Now, a key in understanding true spiritual warfare, brothers and sisters, is to identify who our battle is against. And we know that we are not fighting our brothers and our sisters in the church. We are not fighting our parents. And any child of God, any saint that have issues with parents or parents that have issues with children, and you are not moving to address those issues, be very, very careful. Your warfare cannot be with your mother. Your warfare cannot be with your father. Your warfare cannot be with your children. It's not with your supervisor at the office. It's not with your husband. It's not with your wife. Brothers and sisters, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. If we find that in our warfare, we are wrestling against flesh and blood, it means something has gone wrong and we are fighting the wrong enemy. Your enemy is not your husband. Your enemy is not your wife. Your enemy is not your mother or your father. Your enemy is not your children. Your enemy is not your brother or your sister. And anybody in Christendom, in church, find that you are constantly warring with flesh. Whether it be your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ or mother, father, something is radically wrong. And Satan has somehow successfully gotten you to a place so that you are fighting the wrong enemy. And he is going to add fuel to that and cause you to constantly be in that particular situation and environment because he knows that you have it wrong. And he will foment it and he will keep it there. So I am now saying to all God's people that our warfare is not against flesh and blood. We need to know who the enemy is. And the enemy is against a foe that we are unable to see, but nevertheless is real and is pushing to get you and I. Now I want us to notice in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it starts with a simple term, for we wrestle. I want us to understand that the warfare that you and I are in, Paul describes it as a wrestling. And he used the word wrestle. We wrestle not, but notice it starts, for we wrestle. The word wrestle is taken from the old Greek word pale, P-A-L-E. And it refers to a struggling. It refers to a, 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 an embrace where two folks embrace each other, fighting and wrestling, to the, trying to bring each other to the ground, wrestling a hand-to-hand -hand combat. And it is one of a vicious, and vile nature so that Paul at the start of that verse in Ephesians 6 verse 12 says we wrestle and that Greek word suggests a wrestling a hand-to-hand -hand combat a hand-to-hand -hand fight but I want us also to note that the same Greek word pale is also the Greek word from which the Greeks derive the name palestra. And palestra refers 
to a famous Greek house, a big place like an arena where they did what is called combat sports. Follow me now. There are three types of these combat sports that takes place in this palestra. One is called boxing. You and I know boxing. But the boxing that took place back then is not like the boxing that you and I know now where they have on a soft glove and they punch each other even though it is vicious now. This is like Sunday school compared to boxing then. Then in the palestra, they had no gloves. In fact, they would place over their knuckles some iron that had in it spikes. So instead of a gloves, you will see iron over the fists of these boxers. And then in the iron would be little spikes ex extruding from the iron. So that when they start to thump at each other, if that iron with the spike in it connects to your face, a piece of your flesh from your face is torn off. These are the kind of combat sports that took place in the palestra back there in Old Greek. This is the kind of wrestling. Boxing was a form of that wrestling. And that boxing, as I said, was so vicious and vile that iron will be placed over the knuckles with spikes interspersed and they will box at each other and they will fight until at least one of them die. That's the combat. That's the kind of wrestling. That's the kind of combat sports that take place in that place that comes from that Greek word pale which is the same Greek word that it, Paul got the word wrestling. Now, boxing was one of the three sports that took place, combat sports that took place in that place. The other was wrestling. And it is pretty much, wrestling is pretty much like what you and I know today when we turn on the television channel and turn to the sports station and see men wrestling where they grab each other by the neck or they lift you up at the waist and drop you on the ground across the knee with the intent to break one's spine so we will see the wrestlers holding each other and embrace each other hand to hand trying to push them in a corner and they'll try to lift each other up and as they lift you up they fall to the ground, boom, with a body blow, trying to break your, the spine of the person that they are fighting against. And so this was how vicious these persons were, whether it was the boxers or whether it was the wrestlers. Their intent, where their opponents are concerned, is to fight to the death and they will they would box to the extent that they will tear off your face with the iron knuckles around their wrist around their knuckles interspersed with spikes and they will put that to your face or put that to your body with the intention to rip your flesh until one of them die the same thing with the wrestlers. They will lift you and drop you to the canvas, drop you to the floor with the intent to break your spine and then to get the better of you. And then thirdly, the third um, combat sports that was practiced in the palestra was what we call today kickboxing. And it was a combination of both the boxers and the wrestlers fighting so that the kickboxing was the most vicious of them all and they will box or they will hold you they will lift you up 
they will go on a, on a if they are in a ring they will go up against the ropes and they will jump down in your neck and they will fight and this is what happened one of these three whether it's the kickboxing the actual wrestling or the the physical boxing one of these three sports and it usually is a fight to the death and brothers and sisters all three of the above are bloody they are vicious and they are extremely violent and it was such that really both boxers or wrestlers or kickboxers very rarely you would see both of them coming out of that ring alive usually one die and the other though he comes out he would be blooded and he would be sometimes maimed but very rarely you see them both coming out of the ring alive one is usually dead in the old greek area arena you would normally have an inscription that goes something like this a boxer's victory is obtained through blood and when it speaks of blood it's not speaking of blood coming from a cut on his face it's speaking of the blood that he had to give up the, the, the opponent had to give up his blood so that that boxer the other boxer could have the victory so he if he is going to be a victorious boxer he obtained that victory through the other his opponent's blood that was how vicious that wrestling boxing match was another inscription of the sports in those days goes something like this if you should hear and these are literal inscriptions that you can read even today in old Greece. If you should hear that your son has died, believe it. But if you should hear that he has been defeated and retired, do not believe it. The question is why? The question is why? And the answer simply is, none of those opponents gets the chance to say oh yes i am defeated and i'm going to go into retirement if they are the ones that are on the losing end and they find that they can't physically continue their opponent is going to take that advantage and they are going to wrestle with them and they are going to box with them and they are going to kick box against them. And they are going to fight to the last, to the extent that the weak one dies. So it is hardly that you are going to see somebody say, all right, I lose, I lose. stop now. They are not going to stop. They are going to fight to the death. And this was the nature of the palestria in which these combat sports take place. They are fight literally to the death. So it is either I am going to win or my opponent is going to win. But we are not coming out both victorious or we are not coming out both losers. One is going to win and one is going to die. This was the nature of the word peel when Paul spoke that we wrestle. He was talking about a violent, bloody encounter that we were in. So it is this very illustration that Paul used to describe our conflict with our unseen enemy. A vicious, violent, bloody, anything go warfare nothing spared 
And I'm saying this because some folks don't understand when they say warfare, what they are actually engaged in. We just talk and use the word as a little cliche. We don't realize that it is something that is there. That if you allow the adversary to get the better of you, he is going to move to kill you. And when I say kill you, no, understand because he's trying to kill you in every wise. Give him the opportunity, even physical death. But he is going to force things into the minds of the people of God to, 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 to cause us to disbelieve the word, to cause us to hate our brother, to cause us to hate the word, to cause us to hate God. This is the nature of the warfare that the people of God are in. And many of God's children don't even know that it is a bloody thing that we are involved in. It is a terrible dangerous match up bitter intense conflict that we are engaged in and so we take our time and go through as if oh it's just another day just another time oh it's just another opportunity tomorrow i will i will try to know brothers and sisters this thing is a matter of life and death this battle this warfare that you and i are engaged in it is important that we understand that it is not a plaything do not take this warfare that we are in for granted do not take it lightly by using the word wrestle the old greek word for pale, Paul is conveying the idea of a bitter, intense, bloody, vicious conflict. You and I might be the ones that are taking it. Oh, I'm in a warfare, you know. The, the, the adversary is trying this against me. But in the name of Jesus, it's much more than that. And many of us just use the term in the name of Jesus. I have the victory and that is it. It is more than that, brothers and sisters. It means when you and I are fighting demonic forces and foes, there are no rules. They will use everything at their disposal. And therefore, you and I must use everything at our disposal. But what do you and I have at our, at our disposal? What do we have? And this is what I really want to get into and share with us. But before I get this, I'm going to come to, I'm going to, come to that at the last. But it is important that we understand the concept, brothers and sisters, saints of the Most High God, that the wrestling match that we are in, the wrestling match that we are in, is very, very, very important that we realize that it is intense, it is deep, it is bitter, it is intense, and if we dare to underestimate the extent, like many of us have, we are in a predicament because we are losing and we don't even know. Coming to church every Sunday is not a sign that you are winning in this wrestling match. Coming to church every time that the doors are open is not a sign that you are victorious and you are going through. No. Because the nature of the warfare is one where he is fighting against us firstly by corrupting our minds the question is how does he corrupt our minds the question is how does he establish strongholds in our minds and therefore cause us to be on the losing end and don't even know it did you know that many of god's people are in the battle in the struggle 
warfare and we are losing and don't even know? When you and I cannot pray and we remain in that condition for long periods of time, we are losing and we don't even know even if we come to church. When you and I are in a particular situation where we are not in the word for an extended period of time and therefore nothing is there to guide us and to push us along a particular path and to show us and we don't know and we just keep not praying, keep not reading the word but we still come church because I am going to tell you this understand how this battle is set up the adversary is going to free up certain arena for people to even be at church knowing that some folks will equate coming to church with overcoming in the warfare and the adversary knows that the person that is not praying the person that is not reading and studying and absorbing and living the word he knows that that is the person that is failing in the warfare but he allows you to come to church and we pat ourselves on the shoulder and we meet with our brothers and our sisters and we meet with our friends and we all have a little every now and then we have a little bible reading or a little discussion about something godly and yet look at the things that we think about look at the things that we allow to be entertained in our minds look at the things that we allow others to push into our system and we embrace it and this is where the battle turns and the enemy starts to get the upper hand because he is now filling our minds with bitterness and with guile and with evil imagination and with hatred and that is where the battle gets hot and many start to decline and don't even know we think the the warfare is satan coming in our house and and switching on the light and switching it off and so demon in here and the demon getting the upper hand as long as no demon no laugh in my house and as long as no devil no cause the light to switch on and switch off and cause this to happen and turn the the, 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 the dresser the other way and all of that then i am good no you are not that is not spiritual warfare even if that is an aspect later on it is after we open up doors and have a whole heap of doors open that will cause demonic influence and activity to come into our realm in that way we have left doors open but that is just a part spiritual warfare many of us are engaged and we allow the mind to become polluted and open so many other doors because we get involved with illicit things including illicit sexual activity i said it some time ago i am going to say it again now because it is it, it is so crucial that we understand that a young christian that gets involved sexually a young lady that gets involved sexually with a young man that is not from church and is a party guy and he goes to this party and he goes to that one and he goes to that whorehouse and he goes to that one and he goes to that nightclub and he lies with another girl over there and he lies some of these men lie with men too so they have both the homosexual spirit and they have the other kind of spirit of whoredom attached to them and then when you for a moment because of how handsome he is or when you for periods of time go and lie with him or, or vice versa and it could be as brother or a sister in church too when that happens all of a sudden all kind of doors become opened in your life that were never opened before and all of a sudden the warfare takes on a new intensity because doors are now open and you young man you young woman you saint of god would have opened up a chasm for the enemy to come in boldly 
and to stake his claim in your life. And as much as you come to church still on a Sunday or on a Wednesday or on a Friday or whenever, you are just going through the motion because your body is now controlled and your mind has been controlled by the adversary. And he is the master of mind control. Satan's desire is to literally control you and I. And I want us to know that. And so his desire is to control the mind. His desire is to control the body. And this warfare that you and I are in, brothers and sisters, is a warfare for control. Control of your life. And we fail to open up and give God access. We fail to pray and get into the word. And as a result, we open up. And, and this is why, brothers... Sisters, young people, beloved, all of us that are saints. If we think we can hide and commit fornication day in and day out. And you think that the leaders don't know, so I am alright. You are opening up yourself. To Satan in such a way that before long you're going to wish you had just read and embraced and accepted the word of God. There's going to be so much drama and trauma in your life that you're going to wish. Many are going to say, oh, I wish I can find repentance now and might not find it. You think that you are getting away. Oh, I'm having the time of my life and nobody knows. Nobody knows the Holy Ghost is going to. And before the Holy Ghost move, based on how and who you are and what you want God to do in your life, it might just be that the adversary turned the last key and they turned the last screw and you would have now become a son of Beelzebub, a daughter of the devil because we have allowed ourselves to be pushed down in the battle because we fail to realize the extent and the seriousness of the warfare that we are in. You might say, Pastor, why every time you have to touch on this fornication, adultery issue? Why? Because it's the Bible touch on it and say, of all of the, the sins, this is one where you sin against your own body. And God speaks to it in a very particular way. I mean, to, this study is not the study to deal with that. We're going to deal with it in another way. Why it is so vile, why it is so dangerous, and why it will fight against the soul, and you will never advance in God or in the kingdom if we allow ourselves, young man, young woman, to be entrapped. And the warfare that we are in, you are going to find that you are always losing because you are not admitting that you don't have it. You don't have God. You're not where we're supposed to be. And we're still pretending like all is well. It is not well. And without the word, we don't have the offensive weapon. Understand that. So, I want to direct us again back to the screen to look at the slide. Because I want to show that Satan's plan, his desire, is to literally control you. His, he, 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 he's called the prince of this world. He's called the prince of the power of the air. He's called the prince of demons. I'm going to ask to, 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 to turn the slide on and to put the slide up. And you will see the, the Bible calls him the prince of this world. Yes, the Bible calls him the prince of demons. The Bible calls him the prince of the power of the air. And all of these things is... Is, is simply showing that he wants to control. He wants to control. Satan is the mind manipulator. And I, I state that categorically and I want to explain something um, so that we can understand that his big plan, his big push is to captivate us on the inside. Right? Let's, I want us to look at five names that the Bible gives to Satan, right? So that we can understand that the warfare that he is launching is 
is way of forcing this control on us. He wants to control our minds. He wants to control ultimately our bodies, our action. He, his desire is one of control. And I want us brothers and sisters not to forget that. Satan don't like nothing about you. Satan don't like anything about any one of us. In fact, I am putting it mildly. He hates you. And if he can captivate and capture your mind, he will. If he can captivate and capture your, your heart, he will. Because once he catches that mind, he knows how to establish strongholds there. And that is very important. Now, the Bible calls him some names. The Bible calls him the adversary. Yes, the Bible calls him... Um, in addition to the adversary, the Bible calls him a roaring lion. Then the Bible calls him the angel of light. Then the Bible calls him the devil and Satan. All of these are titles, are names, type of how he is and his ability to twist and to deceive and to lie to people's mind. Want us to understand this. He hates righteousness. And if he is going to mash down righteousness, brothers and sisters, he is going to do it through people. But to do it through people, he first captured their mind and caused them in their minds to think, not no wrong with this, not no wrong with that. I'm going to, I'm going to, let us go through this first one, adversary. Now, the Bible calls Satan our adversary don't even know this but that word adversary comes from the greek word and if you notice brothers and sisters i have been for the last couple of weeks going through the root words of some of these words that we take for granted because sometimes we read the bible and, and it is only when we start to drill a little bit deeper and go a little bit wider that we get the essence of what is being conveyed by these writers. So I just indicated to us that that word wrestle is from our Greek word pale, and it means a, a, a vicious, dangerous combat, like boxing or wrestling or kickboxing. And Paul used that word to convey to us how severe and how serious the warfare that you and I are in. It is important to understand it against that illustration that Paul gave. Because if he didn't give that, we will just take it for granted. Oh, we are in warfare, like how some of us describe it. And oh, it's just a, a, a spiritual thing. But we don't realize the intensity and how gory and bloody the thing is. And how Satan, in his quest, because he knows how dangerous it is, is either him or you. And him don't think he's going to go down. So he's looking for you to go down. Any wonder, brothers and sisters, why so many of the soldiers of the Lord, saints of the Most High God, those who once were a part of this salvation, are now outside looking in. The warfare overwhelmed them. And they have faltered. And they fell. And they were blooded. And they were destroyed by the adversary they underestimated the extent and the viciousness and the bloodiness and the goriness of the warfare that they were in. So I am happy that we can drill down and look at the root words so that we can understand the extent and we can see the illustration that is given in scripture so that we know so it's not a plaything. And many folks are taking this thing too lightly. Now look at the word adversary, a description of Satan. And that word comes from the Greek word antidikos, which is a compound of two Greek words, anti and dikos. Now this is describing, brothers and sisters, the adversary, our adversary. Most folks don't even know that when it speaks to adversary, at the heart, at the root of it, is someone that is opposed to everything that is righteous. Let us go deeper 
and look more at the word. Now, anti simply means against, oppose, you're against. And we, we, we know that. Now, in the older Greek language, that same word anti was used to denote a men, the mental condition of a person on the edge of sanity. Somebody that is going off, going off them rockers. Somebody that is getting insane. Right? And this insane person, somebody, you know, on their way to get mad, so to speak. That person was seen as dangerous who could harm others if not restrained. I recall when I was small, going to primary school, there was a lady. Her name was Grant, Miss Grant. And she, I don't know what the situation was, but she had kind of lost it. And everybody, the little kids in the community, you know, our parents would come for us and meet us at the park because she lived just beyond the park and they wanted to get us before, get to us before we reached that section where she lived. Because all the parents, because they realized that Miss Grant was now mad and they realized that the stage of insanity that she was at, she sometimes would take up stone and just start to throw at us children. And so we would tremble, we, we would be so scared. Even our parents were scared and they would come and get us and take us past this lady's place uh, so that in case she decide to become boisterous or to do harm, we would have our parents, you know, to protect us. But this was the person that that word anti also described, somebody on the edge of sanity who could harm you if not restrained. restrained. So the word anti has a negative spin to it. All right? So that is one of the two words. So remember, we said the adversary is from the Greek word anti-dikos. And anti means to simply to be against. But it has a negative spin on it because it, 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 it speaks to somebody who is losing their minds and is aggressive if they are not restrained. And so it is an aggressive person against that is what anti mean. Now, the other word, dikos, and this is the root of the Greek word meaning righteousness. Most folks didn't know this. So it refers to justice. Dikos refers to righteousness. Dikos refers to fairness. That's right. So that when the words are compounded together, when the two words are compounded together, yes, anti-dikos, which is the word that we get, from which we get adversary. When the words are put together, compounded together, they portray one who is adamantly, vehemently opposed to righteousness. Yes. So, because the word anti carries the idea of hostility, then this tells us that the devil, adversary, is hostile towards righteousness and desires to destroy righteousness or anyone who wants to follow through on being righteous. Brothers and sisters, your adversary don't take the term lightly. He is opposed to righteousness. And listen, this adversary, because of his opposition to righteousness, his plan is to access your mental faculties and to inject in it. Can you, can you recall... Brothers and sisters, can you recall a situation as a child of God where you see another brethren? And this is how Satan works. This is how the adversary does his thing. This is how Satan is wicked. And we don't even realize we are unaware and that's why we are going through this. And I want us to understand the nature of the warfare. And therefore understand why we need word. 
deep inside and why we need the book so that we have a offensive weapon the sword to fight against the adversary it is important that we understand we are saying that adversary is from two greek word that effectively means against righteousness so he puts things together and shows and cause people to become hostile towards things that are righteous did you know that there are those in christendom in the body of christ where if they see another brother or another sister trying to walk righteously trying to establish and to embrace a certain standard of living conduct themselves as best as they can they try to walk according to the word do you know that in church right now there are those who look at that brother or look at that sister and, and, and question and ridicule them and say, why are you so holy, holy? Do you know that there are brethren in church that try to destabilize those that seek to walk with God in a particular way and try to tell them, you go on like you're Mr. Righteous. Or Mrs. Righteous. And you're more righteous than anybody else. You must forget the self-righteousness. And they try to get at your mind. But I challenge every well-thinking child of God to rebuke and reject any sin. That try to belittle your attempt to follow through on the word. And live a certain level of righteousness unto the Lord. It is... The plan of the adversary. He is called the adversary because the root of that is someone that is against, opposed, vehemently opposed, righteousness. When a brother can look at another brother, when a sister can look at another sister and criticize you, for attempting to walk righteous according to the word. And say so you're going like you're better than anybody else. That brother that is doing the criticism. And trying to tear you down. Is being used by the enemy. The adversary himself. They don't have the word. They don't love the word. They are not in the word. And they are trying to bring you down. Don't let Satan stop you on your way. Saint of God. That's a trick of the enemy. And so I firstly encourage the saint of God who is pursuing righteousness to pursue it and walk in the word. I then say to those that would try to obstruct those living righteously, you get in the word and be guided accordingly so that Satan don't use you because his intent Satan's intent is to manipulate and to take control of our minds, a highway, one road leading to the mind, so that he can destabilize and hence his name, adversary, against righteousness, anti-righteousness. That is what word is used to describe Satan. And we need to go, we need to understand that. The other one is that, number two, is, he, he, he is described as a roaring lion. A roaring lion. Now, the lion is a powerful animal in the jungle. And it is important that we understand that carefully. The roar of a lion literally drives fear. In the heart of man. However, in the case of the devil, his roar is more fearsome, praise God, than his bite. And it is important that we understand that. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 makes that point very clear to us. And I want to re emphasize. 
I want to make that point clear in our minds as children of God. Doesn't matter who you are or how you feel. It is important that we understand that Colossians 2 verse 15 victoriously declares and having spoiled principalities and power he which is Jesus made a show of them openly tr triumphing over them in it brothers and sisters I want us to understand that by means of the cross and the resurrection Jesus Christ stripped these demonic powers beer of the authority that they once possessed it doesn't matter how they bark and how they carry on and etc etc Jesus Christ victory over them was so thorough that he even made a show of them openly what does that mean it means that he paraded them through the streets just as in the old time when the king went out to battle and he won and he was victorious over another country he brought in the king that he had subdued and he brought in those other soldiers that were, he had subdued and brought them into his territory and walked them through that everybody could see them and see that they are under his control well that is what jesus did to the demonic powers that had their thing going for them at that particular time jesus spoiled principalities and powers and remember the bible said that these principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places were the different strata of demonic activities that we had to deal with and here he's saying to the colossians the apostle paul he spoiled principalities and he spoiled powers and we could extend that by saying he spoiled spiritual wickedness in high places and he's put every realm every hierarchy of demonic influence and power he spoiled or he mashed them down and he has the power over them and it is important that he we understand that however this has not stopped the devil from trying to sound dreadful and that's why i'm saying he's going forth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and i want us to understand you know the term first peter 5 verse 8 I, I, you can just ju ju write it down i won't even turn to it first peter 5 verse 8 and it says that he seeks he goes about seeking whom he may devour. The word seek implies that not everyone will fall prey to these tactics. And I want us to also understand that Satan is not just seeking just anyone to devour. He is seeking those whom he may devour. In other words, the enemy is looking for those who are weak, in faith who are ignorant of the word of god yes ignorant of the word of god don't have the word don't read the word don't have the word guiding their steps he's looking for those he's seeking for those those are the ones who he wants to devour and that's why i'm saying brothers and sisters it is important that we have the word dwelling in us richly guiding our steps walking therein very very important so he's seeking looking for those who are weak in faith he's looking for those who are ignorant of the word of god he's looking for those who are isolated unto themselves he's looking for those who are not mature enough to stand in the face of his constant hassling and pushing and those are the ones that are going to be sub by satan it is important he's also called an angel of light he's also called the devil he's also and remember devil we said we discussed it a couple weeks ago so we won't go back into it but of course satan is also called devil 
In fact, the New Testament refers to him as such more than 40 times. And that is something that we need to remember. The, the name devil is taken from the, the Greek word, which we have gone through already, diabolos. And it is a compound of the words dia and balos. Dia meaning through. Dia means through and carries with it the idea of penetration. The word balos is taken from the Greek word balo, which means to throw, I throw, as it is throwing a ball or throwing a rock. When the two words are compounded together, the new word depicts the act of repeatedly throwing a ball or throwing a rock against something until it penetrates that barrier and breaks through to the other side. So Satan, you remember we also used that little situation with David and Goliath, where for 40 days, Goliath would stand up every day, morning and evening, and he would speak, and he would speak, and he would defy God, and say, send me a man, and he would cause that constant bombardment of the minds of the people to weary them down. The man never draw sword after the armies of Israel. All he did was speak and constantly day and night, morning and evening, morning and evening for 40 days. This is how Satan works. Constant bombardment, constant bombardment of our mind until he breaks through. And so the devil is really the one who hit the mind, hit the mind. Don't do this. Don't go to church. Don't read the Bible. We are pray for. Don't do it. And after a while, we find that it, we just say, you know, I'm tired. Oh, God, you know, I want to sleep. You know, every day I do this and I can't even do my schoolwork. And we, after a while, because of the constant attack on the mind, we find that we start to do the other things and leave out the things that are most important. It is a trick of the enemy and his name, devil, which means to constantly push till he penetrates the barrier and breaks through to the other side. He's trying to get through to the other side of our minds, brothers and sisters. And I am telling us to reject these onslaught of the devil. How do we really reject the onslaught of the devil? How do we really get away from this constant bombardment and pushing and thrusting and beating of the mind? It is going to come in a very powerful, powerful way. And that is going to be through. And I'm just going to jump a few slides and, 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 and go ahead to something else. And then I'll come back to these afterwards. But I want us to understand that there is going to be some things that we must we are going to have to take, literally, we are going to have to take the bull by the horn. And we are going to have to fight. Fight. To maintain our position as sons of God. You know, the Bible tells us, the kingdom of God suffereth violence. And the violent take it by force. Sometimes we sit down too calm. Sometimes we sit down a little bit too. Uh, we, we take it too easy. We don't understand what we are up against. And so we are placed in a position where we just are unable. We are unable to determine how far gone we are. We are unable to realize how serious, how far, how deep we have gone into the mess because of the extent of this warfare. How many of us have our minds so opened up that Satan have been planting all kind of negative thoughts in it. How many of us have had, I, I jumped some slides a while ago because 
I really want those particular points to jump at us when we meet again. Because there are some things that Paul, before he went into this subject of warfare and to show us exactly what we are up against, he actually instructed us to do some things. But I won't touch that now. I'll touch that next week. But I want us to understand that now that we are in this warfare and we are finding out that this is a bloody thing that we are in, that this is a vicious warfare, and it's not just a, a cliche, a word on our tongue to say, oh, we are in warfare and we're going to... This is a literal, real thing that we are in. And the adversary who is the one that is against righteousness. For those who didn't know, we just learned that. And therefore, that adversary tried to make adversaries within the church and cause people within the church, which is a part of the warfare, to fight against those that are seeking to live righteous, mocking you, calling you holy, holy, calling our brothers and sisters, you go on like you're too righteous, you go on like, is you alone, love God. You go on like, all because you are moving to live according to the word. Brothers and sisters, if you find that you are opposing someone that is attempting to do righteous and to live holy, you are admitting that you are allowing the warfare to get the upper hand of you because you are displaying the traits of the adversary himself which is against righteousness. And any child of God that points a finger at another child of God and says, you're, you're too righteous. You go on like you're too holy. You go on like you is all this. You are, you are making yourself out to be losing in this spiritual warfare. And we need to take stock and fix ourselves. How do we do that? I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. And if, if I could ask for us to bring up that scripture, that's a good one I want us to look at. Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 17. Because in closing, I'm going to make this point. It is at the heart of what you and I do. It is at the heart of how we are going to um, advance in this warfare, it is at the heart of how you and I, brothers and sisters, will overcome. Ephesians 6, 17, and take the helmet of salvation. That's how it starts. But this is the part that I want us to focus on now. And the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we are going back to the slide that was just up. And I want us to follow me. As I explain some things to us, it's very important. Yes, so that it is important that we understand, brothers and sisters, that the most aggressive, offensive weapon that God has given to the body of Christ is the sword of the spirit. And in the scripture that we just read, we realize that it clearly defines for us what the sword of the spirit is. It says, which is the word of God. Brothers and sisters, if we don't have the word, it means that we don't have the sword of the spirit. And if we don't have the sword of the spirit, 
it means we are lacking the most aggressive and offensive weapon that God has given to us to use in this warfare that we are in. It is almost like what I started out by saying that we are f the, the security forces is fighting with criminal elements. And all the criminals have their M16s and their AK-47. And the police and soldiers only have bulletproof vests and, and shoes and helmet. And they can only take cover. But they cannot return the fire. And it is only going to be a matter of time that the criminal elements, if they see that, are going to come out of hiding and are going to walk over to where the police and the soldiers would have been taking cover and turn their guns on them because they don't have any aggressive, offensive weapons to return the fire. In this case that Paul made reference to, it is not guns that he used in his illustration, but he used a sword because the armies back there use swords in their warfare. But what is very important, and this is what I want to extract for us, brothers and sisters, the Roman soldiers of that day, of that time, over time had about five different kind of swords that they use in their confrontations with enemy forces. About five different types. And it is very significant that of the five that were used, Paul made reference to only one. And there is a reason. And I want us to quickly look at that. The first sword that they use, they, they call it the gladius. This was a very heavy sword and it was hard to maneuver. You know, it had a very long blade. One side was very sharp, but the other side was dull. And it had a long blade and it was very heavy. And so when they go out to battle, if you swing and you miss, you know, to get back your composure, to start to fight the enemy again it took a while because the sword was heavy it was long and then what made it worse it was only sharp at one side so if you miss hitting your target the first time you're going to have to get it back into position to wield it again and so the the roman soldiers at one point when they lost a particular battle they zeroed it down to the the kind of sword that they had it was too hard to maneuver and hunger and so that's the first sword and after a while they changed the sword to some shorter swords narrower swords so that it was much easier to carry and it was there also much easier to swing in battle and so that was the second sword then they, they, they had a third sword because they keep evolving trying to get the best of the best uh, you know they were the superpower of the day and they wanted to ensure that they had the best and the third sword that they had was even shorter than the second one in fact it looked like a dagger and uh, it, it served them well for a while but they believed that the the soldiers it it wasn't wise to have such a short sword even though it was easy to handle it was easy to maneuver but because of how short it was they had to get too close to the enemy and they could endanger themselves that way and so they upgraded that to a fourth sword which was longer slender but it wasn't very effective in battle it was too thin and so while they might hit one particular opponent with it by the time they had to take it back and to it, it, it just did not have the kind of clout. And so they ultimately upgraded that fourth sword into the fifth sword. And this particular sword is the one that Paul referred to when he wrote about spiritual armor. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 that we just read. And it says, And the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the word of God. Now, listen to this. This is the literal word that Paul had in his writing that referred to sword. Right? The word for sword used in this text was the Greek word macharia. M-A-C-H-A-I-R-A. -A -A. This was a brutal weapon of murder. In fact, let me tell you a little bit about this particular sword. This sword had both sides of it sharpened. And then at the end of it, at the tip, it turned up and went up in the air so that it had a sharp tip. So this sword now was a sword with two edges. Yes. It had, it had one side sharpened, the other side sharpened, and then the tip of it turned upwards. And Paul literally used this macharia to describe the sword of the spirit that you and I are supposed to have taking us into the battle. Very important concept. Very, and I go, I'm going to have to close here. So we won't even get to go further into it. But I'm going to close explaining the concept. And we pick up when we get together. When we get together next week. This sword was sharpened on both sides. This sword was sharpened on both sides. And as I said, at the tip of it, it turned up. And that tip was also very sharp. So both sides and the tip sharp. It was called a weapon of brutal murder. Because how the soldiers did it. First time when they pushed that sword into the enemy, they just pulled it out. One side was sharpened and it had a straight edge. And it just push it in and pull it out. And the enemy sometimes survive being thrust through with a sword like that. But this particular sword with two edges and with the mouth turned up was different. It was called an instrument of murder, a brutal weapon. What they did... They pushed it inside of the enemy. But because it was sharpened on both sides, it was easy now to turn. And with the tip turned down, when they turned it, it grabbed into the entrails, the, the interior of the adversary, the, the enemy, and gripped the tripe and every organ that is inside. And then they pull it out. So that they push it in, easily turned it, gripping the organs and intestines and everything and pulled it out. So that when they came back out, the interior of the enemy soldier came out with it. No enemy soldier could survive the Macharia sword. It was an instrument of brutal murder and it was feared by the enemies of Rome. Of all the five swords that were mentioned that were carried by the Roman army, the Macharia was the most vicious, most brutal, most murderous. And brothers and sisters, this was the one that Paul referred to 
in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. Paul was saying that the sword of the spirit which we have at our disposal is akin to the two-edged sword with the tip that the Roman soldiers used and that drove fear into the heart of every enemy. And Paul was saying this sword of the spirit is nothing else but the word of God. That we are going to take this sword and we are going to push it in the adversary and turn it and pull it out and pull out the entrails of the adversary, the devil, so that we can have the upper hand. And for that to happen, we must use this sword the Macharia sword. And he said that this brutal weapon is the word of God. It was an offensive instrument. And if you are going to juke or push it into the adversary and turn it and pull it out and cause destruction and death and mayhem in the camp of the enemy who, with whom we are having this warfare, Paul was saying that offensive, aggressive push is going to come by way of the two-edged sword that you and I have. And brothers and sisters, that sword is nothing else but the word of God. Those Christians that are not living in the word don't have any weapon of offense to attack the enemy and so that's the reason why many of us are constantly under attack and we can't fight back and we're taking lick left right and center we do not have the word to push and juke and turn and slice and pull out the entrails of the enemy we need the word of God. It is the sword of the spirit. And it is what? Of course, in addition to the other armory that we would have had. But the offensive weapon is the sword. And if we don't have the sword, how can we be victorious in battle? I have some more to say on that. I have some more to talk about as it relates to the two-edged sword. Revelation 1 and verse 16. Revelation 2 also speaks about the two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 talks about the sword with two edges. Piercing even to the dividing asunder. Soul and spirit is a discerner of the intent of... Look, we're going to get into it. We're going to understand... What it is that we are missing out. What it is that we are causing to happen to us. Because we fail to read and study and live in the word. Brothers and sisters, we stop here this evening. I can only admonish us, encourage us as we go through the ser series. Walk in the word. And we can only walk in the word when we know the word. And we will only know the word when we read and study the word. This book and that which is containing it provides us with the sword of the spirit to push into the adversary and turn and cause brutal, massive hemorrhaging on the part of the enemy. And that will only happen when we use the sword. When we have the sword and use it. And the sword is the word of God. Brothers and sisters, walk in the word. God bless you in Jesus' name. Can we pray? Father in heaven, we bless your great name.
Thank you one more time. Thank you for one more opportunity to get into the Word. We are drawing closer now as we drill down to see how critically important it is to read the Word, study the Word, and walk in the Word. Because the Word is the sword that we must use against our adversary, the devil. Help us to read the Word, mighty God. Help us to study the words, mighty God, and help us to walk in the word. We bless your great name. We thank you. Bless your people. I pray for our young people. I pray for the elderly saints. I pray for all the brethren, all the people of God. Impress it upon our minds and our hearts, mighty God, to get into the word and live and walk in the word so that we can be victorious Christians and we can be sure that we are going to be there when the trumpet of God sounds. Bless your people. Bless us abundantly. Let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. The Lord bless you. We thank you so much for joining us in Bible study. And just one quick one as I close. For all those folks that purchased your copy of the book one minute to midnight on amazon uh, or you know amazon whether it's paperback or amazon via kindle once you purchase that book and i believe quite a number of you have i make a very special request this evening uh, a very special plea to you i want you to work with me on this it is extremely important that you go back on Amazon and under the section of the book that says review, I'm going to ask you, brothers and sisters, you know, friends that have purchased a copy of the book, I need to have about a hundred and odd, at least a hundred and ten positive reviews. It's very important. It's crucial for the ranking of the book. And so I ask you, all across Canada, the UK, the US, wherever it is that you have purchased, once you purchase on Amazon, go back to Amazon, go to One Minute to Midnight, and I'm asking you, please, please, give a, good, a positive review of the book. Say what you have learned from it, how it has impacted. Very short but a review and a positive one. And that is extremely important to me. And I thank you, saints, friends, for doing that review. And do it quickly. Don't wait until tomorrow. Do it today. It's very important. The Lord bless you. Thanks again. And God's willing, next week, if our lives are spared, if the Lord tarries, we get back to another Bible study in Jesus' name. God bless you.